What's up guys and welcome back to Rule of Two Review. My name is Rob and today it's a day I've been waiting for for a very long time. I'm going to count down my 10 favorite games of 2014. All right, so it is, of course, that time of year. Here we are just a couple of weeks away from the end of the year, 2014, heading into a really badass-looking year with 2015 for all consoles, the 3DS, and the PC market. 2015 will be a banner year. Um, but, of course, in my excitement for that, I want to look back and reflect on the year that was in 2014 because I'm sure most of us would agree it's another great year for gaming. It didn't feel quite as nonstop amazing with title releases like 2013 really did but honestly you know when you look at the last couple of months and over the holiday and stuff there really was a ton of great games to play for everything it was a wonderful wonderful year um, I had the couple favorites that I knew were going to shoot right to the top of my list and then I had to really take some time and kind of plan and plot out how the rest of my top 10 was going to go. Uh, it's, you know, it was a lot of fun to do, but as these things always are, it was so very difficult because there's, you know, five, six, ten games that I would have liked to have included, but sadly a top 10 list can only be 10 games long. It's kind of really a sign of a pretty strong year when it's that hard to fit 10 games on the list, you know? The years when you're stretching to find all those extra spots filled up, that's when you know it really wasn't a good year, but this year, forget about it. It was really hard to narrow it down to 10 you know like I said there was four or five that I knew were for sure filling out the rest of the list was more difficult but again it was also more fun that stuff is actually fun to do when you think back and you know all the games that really made a difference and an impact on your gaming life throughout the year um I do have to leave the one caveat, um, which I do whenever I make these lists. I always try to remind people of that. Before I get going with number 10, um, again, I am only one gamer. I am one man. Uh, I don't have, you know, unlimited time to play every game. I also don't have unlimited income to play every game. Uh, I did play most, and I usually do. Um, and then, of course, the last and most important thing is, honestly, I also don't love every game. So there are a lot of big games that I kind of don't really go out of my way to play. Uh, a couple of the ones that actually shoot to the top, um, to the front of my brain when thinking about this. Uh, Titanfall was a game I really wanted to play, and I've yet to play. Infamous I wanted to play, didn't get to play it. Uh, the GTA V um, re-release, I'm not really into GTA, so that's a game that a lot of people would love. I just didn't play because I don't love GTA. Um, Last of Us Remastered, which I love the game to death, but the remaster I didn't go near. Broken Age Act 1, I wanted to play so badly and didn't get to. I'm not a Pokemon guy, so I didn't play Pokemon. Assassin's Creed, I don't care about, and apparently Unity was awful anyway. Far Cry 4 is not my thing. Uh, there were several racing games this year, like Drive Club and The Crew and Forza and all that stuff. Those are just not my things. People love them, so that may disappoint you that all of these kinds of games won't be on the list. Some of them I didn't get to play. Some of them I just have no interest in, and so that's, you know, again, I just don't get to play everything. I'm, I'm only one guy, so I only have from the games that I play played in 2014 to choose from again you know i did get to play most i own both a ps3 and a 360 uh i of course have my wii u which does also play wii games although there was no wii games this year um and you know the wii u had a great lineup and then i also have a ps4 and an xbox one so i and a pc and a 3ds so i've played literally the gamut there's most games i did get to play so you got an idea of some of the ones i didn't get to play or weren't interested in now i'm going to shut up because i know you're waiting for me to get to the list so here we go i'm going to kick it off with number 10. all right and coming in at number 10 is the one the only dark souls 2 because yes, I absolutely love Dark Souls. Uh, I very much welcome the punishing difficulty. I don't normally like games that are that kind of difficult, you know, the, the, with the repetitive kind of play through the same areas and get better and better until you can actually get farther. Most games like that kind of tend to annoy me. I'm not so much about the skill that, I, that that's what I look for in most games. However, Dark Souls has this amazing magical formula that if you haven't played it, you don't understand. But if you've played it, you've probably gotten it. It just hooks you and it makes that difficulty worthwhile. I think it's mostly aided by the fact that it is beyond rewarding. And when a game is rewarding in that way, you know, aided by the fact that it's difficult, they kind of work in tandem. It's super difficult, but it's super rewarding. So it's hard to play, but because it feels so good whenever you accomplish something, you keep playing the next hard part until you get that reward again. It's almost like a, it's like holding that, you know, perfect snack, just dangling the reward, the good feeling right in front of you, you know, like a carrot on a string saying, oh, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it. And then when you don't, you're like, fuck! And then you go back and try it again. And when you get there, it is worth it. Uh, it's a much better looking game than both Demon Souls and Dark Souls. You know, I like those games well enough, but Dark Souls 2 was an amazing leap forward. The world just felt great. I really liked how the NPCs kind of fleshed out the world a little bit better in this than in, I think, Dark Souls 1. Some people feel the opposite, which I get, because Dark Souls 1 was very good. 
I didn't spend nearly as much time with it, though. Dark Souls 2 hooked me. I played, you know, very far into this game as far as my previous history with the series. Um, So, I don't know. They just struck this perfect balance of still being embarrassingly hard to play, you know, but at the same time, it's got this, this weird kind of hidden level of forgiveness that if you figure out the particulars of how and why the game is difficult, you can still create your own worthwhile path through that game and not feel like the game has beaten you down as much as the previous games. It depends. It depends on your level of skill and your determination and dedication to getting good at that game and figuring out the particulars. So I really look forward to going back and finally starting a different character class. I only played through as one. Uh, I think the knight is what it was. It's been a while now but it was the it was the dual wielding character great great care great class um so yeah i don't know i mean dark souls those games they're so alienating they're not for everybody and i get that however i love it and i do have to say that with dark souls 2 from software took an amazing leap forward and made their best game yet at number nine comes a very special game that is very near and dear to my hearts and probably a lot of your guys is out there as well for any old school gamers um that is the super addicting mario kart 8 uh, Mario Kart is a stalwart franchise in most gamers' lives in history. Um, you know, going back to the SNES and the 64 days, and we kind of knew to expect a new Mario Kart with, you know, a new Nintendo system. That was definitely going to happen. Mario Kart, even its worst iterations, have still been fantastic. I mean, I, Double Dash might arguably be my least favorite, maybe? And it was still amazing. And then you come to Mario Kart 8, where they finally found a way, the first time in a long time, to really change up the formula and a lot of what makes the game great and a lot of what makes it fun to play and addictive. Um, the verticality, the new weapon system, the online play is better than it's ever been, the level design, the DLC. You know, it's there's so much going on with Mario Kart 8. The, the cart and character customizations, the roster, the graphics. It is definitely one of the best-looking, most next-gen games of this year. Um, I mean, I don't know what else to say about Mario Kart. It's the kind of thing that you just expect to be great. And here, Nintendo hit it out of the park. I mean, I definitely have to say that it's probably mostly due to nostalgia and at the time that it released... 64 is probably my favorite of the Mario Kart games. However, really Mario Kart 8 kind of is the best made, and it's probably the one that's going to last the longest, you know, in our hearts and as far as the addictiveness, you know. Um, I, I just can't say enough good things about it. You know, if you've played it, you've understand. You, you understand. If you've seen and read the reviews, you understand. The game is as good, if not better, than most people say. Um, easily one of the best games of the entire year. Uh, and, you know, Mario Kart, it's always awesome. And if you haven't played it, you need to get out and absolutely play this game. Okay, coming in at number eight is a, a very interesting title that's af- actually shifted all over my list. And uh, it was one of the ones that was the hardest to actually place. There was no doubt in my mind it was going to be making the my top ten of the year because it is fantastic. Uh, and that is Dragon Age Inquisition. Bioware coming back to form, really kicking ass, making an absolutely wonderful and beautiful masterpiece. Uh, Now, when it comes to Dragon Age specifically, it should be noted that I am one of the few people who will stand by Dragon Age 2. I loved Dragon Age 2. It is not as good as Origins. The Origins is like the flawless kind of masterpiece for that sort of, you know, epic old school RPG formula that Bioware is so good at. Uh, but Dragon Age 2 had so much worthwhile going on that, you know, besides the, the repetitiveness of the, lo- the locations and the smallness of the world, it was still great. You know, I thought the story was, the characters were kind of blah, but the story was interesting and the combat, oh my gosh, the combat. Now, Dragon Age Inquisition is interesting in how they kind of have merged sort of the combat where it's, it very much is kind of like an action hack and slash sort of feel, still with the tactical abilities that Dragon Age Origins and then even further Dragon Age Age 2 perfected with your ability to freeze the combat and set everyone in motion and say this person's going to do this to this enemy and I'm going to do this to this and this person does this and then you let it engage. Um, Dragon Age 2 made that so good I can't even put into words how fantastic I thought that was. Dragon Age Inquisition again it does have that but it's also got a pretty deep and excellent hack and slash system. So the thing that made me sort of consider where I wanted to place this game on this list is the fact that what they have is amazing. The hack and slash is so good, but the game is almost designed so that the the pausing ability isn't really necessary. I mean, I've played pretty far into the game, probably not as far as, as I would like to have, but it's a long game and I have a lot to play. Um, so, you know, again, the hack and slash stuff is so great. And it sort of kind of nullifies the need to really use the the pause system, which sucks because I loved that. 
um, previously. And and it also, again, just the way you're combating enemies in this game, um, it just doesn't really call for the pausing ability very often. I've used it for sure, but um, I don't know. Maybe when certain different things happen way later in the game, I don't. And it could also just have to do with how people play. Um, but at the same time, really, I'm not even complaining because again, it's it's a boon to how good the hack and slash, you know, in the real time combat is. Uh, beautiful worlds. The music is so good in this game. The story is a little convoluted, and it seems like everyone's all over the place. Um, I think they forced in almost too many characters and too many things. You know, at, at the very end, it's or at the very beginning. Sorry, it's very front heavy, but it's still such a rich and vibrant and fleshed out world that that's what makes you wanting to keep traverse it very varied locations i'm loving a lot of the new party members um having varic come back as a wonderful connection to the previous game and the, the previously established lore of dragon age it's weird because i will say dragon ages one and two felt very much a part of the same story and this one you know so far it doesn't feel that way it feels a little bit separate from those um, which is too bad in the Dragon Age sense, but as far as just being a game, it's amazing. Um, obviously, just a couple of nights ago, it did win Game of the Year for 2014. While it wasn't my first choice, I definitely think it's worthy of that, so I'm very glad that it won. Bioware did an amazing job, so congrats to you guys. You deserve that award. You made an amazing game, easily one of the best games of 2014. Coming in at number seven is a game that I cannot tell you guys how many hours I have sunk into this game and this franchise in the past, dating back now, I don't know, 12, 13, 15 years. Um, and that is going to be Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls. Yes, another PC entry. Of course, Dragon Age and Reaper of Souls technically available on consoles as well. But this, this is a PC experience to me. That is how Diablo is meant to be played. You need a mouse and a keyboard. That's what it's looking for. It's looking for hot keys. It's looking for potions and mana usage. It's looking for that mouse clicking all over the damn place. It's, it's so great. Now, it should be noted that simply because we're really looking at an expansion, that's why it probably places at number seven, whereas really, I kind of feel like Diablo three is worthy of being higher at least reaper of souls specifically that's how i feel i love me some diablo diablo 3 i thought was already really really good yes there were issues some people were disappointed but there is no doubt that reaper of souls almost felt like a completely new game uh the new crusader class is fantastic the brand new act that they added to the end of the game is so much content so much going on story-wise so much more to do new enemies um, and the the revamped loot system and the removal of the of the real life auction house they just did so many great things you know money and uh, destroying uh, uh, weapons and, and items actually has value. You actually need to craft things and take advantage of that. Uh, the gem system actually makes more sense. And so, I mean, it's literally... So, okay, when you look at Reaper of Souls, for anyone who maybe hasn't played or isn't familiar with the Diablo stuff or what Blizzard typically does... Um, what they've really done is they've taken all the practical elements, the mechanics of the game that were kind of flawed. They fixed those with the loot, the crafting, the items, all that good stuff, the leveling up. But then they also improved the content by adding a whole new class with a whole new weapon weapon set and brand, and a uh, um, skills branch, as well as a whole new story element with a whole brand new act, Act Five. It's like another several hours worth of content. Um, a little highly priced, I won't lie, but at the end of the day, it made an already great game so much better. I couldn't help but appreciate that. So getting back into Diablo 3 and just that world all over again, hearing that music, seeing these awesome new locations and playing that creator class, which really isn't very good up until about level 10. Once you start getting some more long range attacks and more power past level 10, oh my god, he's badass. What a melee bastard he is. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, you know, um, the PC stuff, not everyone reaches out to PC gaming, but I, of course, love it just as much as I love my console stuff. Blizzard's amazing. Diablo, always amazing. And definitely Reaper of Souls, a vast improvement on an already great game. And at number six comes a game that I wasn't quite sure if I was going to include in this list, but at the end of the day, I realized it absolutely made sense, and you will find out why. That title is The Walking Dead Season 2 by Telltale Games, of course, the infamous studio that is just crushing it with title after title and game series after game series. Walking Dead was the kind of the, uh, the first season was the game that put them on the map in 2012. They won the game of the year. Uh, it changed my life. It changed how I looked at these kinds of games and what the studio was doing, and I just can't say enough good things about Telltale and about The Walking Dead games specifically. The Walking Dead Season 2, while not quite as good as Season 1, is still fantastic. Um, only the first episode came out in the very, very end of 2013. Since the other four episodes, including, of course, the conclusion released in 2014, I felt pretty comfortable saying, I'm just going to make this a 2014 
game, qualify it for that as such. Um, I did actually include the first episode in my favorite games of 2013 as its own episode. So I feel really good about saying, you know, again, I'm just going to make the whole thing now a 2014 release. Um, it's interesting because with The Walking Dead specifically, I, I'm so invested in the characters, uh, the world, Clementine, how this branching, you know, dialogue uh, trees kind of happen with Telltale stuff and just that level of emotion and stress and guilt if the wrong things happen and the, wrong, and the people you like are involved somehow. So fantastically done. Um, what I will say is it, it's kind of an interesting beast, specifically with Walking Dead Season 2, because there are so many different ways that season two can end. And I both read about it and then researched and watched all the under other endings after I finished my own game. Um, and more so than the previous season, there are so many different ways for this to end. And what I noticed is literally half of them, there's like four five, six total or so literally half of them, I think are horrible. Like I would have, I would have felt so not as good about my entire experience of the season. If I'd gone with those, luckily I made what I personally find to be the correct choices, the choices that at least made my story the way I wanted it to go. Uh, and that's the beauty of these games is you can craft your own story. So since it delivered for me the way I wanted the story to deliver and had an ending that put me in tears, it was so beautiful yet sad yet. And you know, you know, lifting of the spirits at the same time. Uplifting was the word I was looking for. Sorry. It had all of these things going on at the end, the way I chose my story to end. And I couldn't have been more thrilled with it. I mean, the game is just so good. I cannot wait to say, I, I will tell you, you know, spoiler alert, there definitely is going to be a season three. That story is nowhere near being complete. Uh, I could see it maybe going to four seasons before they maybe end it completely. What they set up in season two, so wonderful, and it's really going to be interesting because the endings can be so vastly different that A, someone might either love it like I did or hate it if they pick the wrong ending, and B, wherever season three is going to go, I mean, it, it, it's they're, they're so, there's such different paths. I don't know how they're going to make season three without making literally two or three different versions based on what you're ending. I mean, I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see. So anyway, I mean, I, I could gush about it all day long. Obviously, I love the game. I love the series. I think Telltale is great. So there's no doubt that the conclusion to The Walking Dead season two was one of the best experiences I had this year. Alrighty, and here we are breaking into the top five. First half of this list is done. On to the back half of this list. And coming in halfway through at number five is Hyrule Warriors, um, the Tecmo Koei team up with Nintendo for them to actually take on their, you know, most storied and famous franchise, The Legend of Zelda, and mix it with the, the typical Dynasty Warriors kind of formula and create this crazy fast-paced strategic action game where you're just devastating enemy after enemy and leveling up like crazy using all these Zelda characters set in Zelda you know, locations and with crazy Zelda music and Zelda items and Zelda enemies and bosses and all this stuff. It's there is so much Zelda love happening here that that is half of the reason why I'm including this so high in this list. And I am a huge Zelda maniac. It's my second favorite series of all time. The other half of the reason that it's making it so high in this list is because the game is that goddamn good. It is probably the game... I would have to say, <clears throat> except for maybe Diablo, and only because Diablo came out so much earlier in the year, but Hyrule Warriors, I've probably spent more time on than any other game this year. And that includes some of the other games still coming up on this list that very much are replayable kind of experiences, you know, even more so than Mario Kart, for example. It is so fun. It is so addictive. There's something so special about playing these characters that, you know, we love from this amazing, amazing franchise and universe. And then just this super fun combat and you're just devastating everything. And it's it's both really simple in the sense that you, that you just run around killing everything and taking bases and just doing all this, but also completely complex in its leveling up and experience system, its loot system, and its upgrade system to all the enemies and your characters and their abilities and, and, the, and the weapons. There's so much content going on. There's an adventure mode. There's a free mode. There's the, le there's the uh, legend mode. Um, the multiplayer stuff, I haven't even tried, but I hear it's a little bit of a letdown, so I'm going to have to concede that that's probably a problem again it's not how i've been playing the game i just love popping that sucker in dlc has been coming out finally they had great dlc packs and it's i mean there's no doubt that we're looking at a fan service kind of game here where a lot of the things that make me love this game are the fact that it's like wow i can get this amazing you know ocarina of time 
you know, costume set and weapon set for my characters. And just because I love that game, that helps me love it more. And, you know, all I can do is just say, hey, I can just admit it and just go on with it and be like, too bad, so sad. Like, to me, that works. The game is so mechanically sound anyway that I feel okay about that. If it was broken, that would be a different story. But when you consider how fun it is, how much amazing Zelda love and care went into this game, and the awesome DLC and the replayability, I mean, it is, I will still, well into next year and beyond, I will still be coming back to Hyrule Warriors. Alrighty, and now we get to the really fun stuff, because coming in at number four is going to be one of those very controversial games. And any list like this is controversial. I'm sure a lot of people have had problems with, you know, the six games I've named up so far, but... This is the way it is, you know, I'm myself making my own list, and when it comes to number four, I stand by this decision. That game for me is Destiny. Bungie's first take on a new world, a new franchise, a new universe that isn't Halo. Um, and I cannot, cannot tell you guys how much fun I've had with Destiny. Uh, I know a lot of people have issues with whether or not it delivered on the online universe and the experience, the multiplayer component, all these other things. I get it. And some of that stuff is certainly, they're pretty, you know, valid, incredible complaints. But based on how I've experienced the game, what I've looked to get out of it and what I have gotten out of it, it's one of those situations where those problems for some people have not plagued my experience. This game is beautiful. The music is the best of the year. I stand by that, it is the best original music. Again, you've got stuff like Zelda, which is, you know, new takes on time-tested songs, you know, from a franchise. That doesn't count. I'm talking about new music, a brand new orchestrated score, and there is no doubt that Destiny devastates everyone in the sound department, and that is a wonderful thing. So many locations, crazy loot, upgradability, the hub system is a lot of fun. The multiplayer stuff has been great for myself. I've spent a lot of time on with other people. I love the, the strike stuff, where you get on these fire teams with strangers or friends and you take down these very difficult missions oh my god and let's get down to the best thing about it for me and i i like first person shooters not everyone does but i'm a huge fan of first person shooters and i'll tell you what it is the best feeling best controlling best playing first person shooter i have ever played the end better than anything better than the best halo games better than call of duty better than any of the other just so many games i could probably think of a name if i took my time they they pale in comparison to what destiny allows you to do there is so much agility there's so much speed it's so fluid it's beautiful to look at you feel so precise with every single weapon no matter what its stats or abilities or power is it's just the most amazing game i mean it's I'm trying not to make this, uh, you know, a list where I just gush over and over again about every game, but I mean, I'm making a list of my 10 favorite games, and these reasons are why Destiny is so good to me. Love the universe, love the, the atmosphere, all the varied locations, the weapons, the loot, and the controls. It's the best feeling, best playing, probably best looking game I've seen in 2014. Okay, you guys can put away all your rotten tomatoes that you've been wanting to throw at the screen after hearing me talk about how much I love Destiny, because now we're on to number three. Number three was a surprise hit for me. Uh, I really hope that this game garners a lot of love and can see success in the future, especially if it can become a franchise. A brand new IP, something we don't see enough in the gaming industry, that is Sunset Overdrive. Uh, the Xbox One exclusive by Insomniac Studios. Holy cow, this game is so fun and that is the key word just like Hyrule Warriors and Mario Kart on this list before it it's the pure unadulterated straightforward fun of a game like this that makes it so good um, the controls are certainly fantastic but it's not what stands out visually it looks amazing but that's not what makes it memorable it's just a fun world to explore with so many possibilities and it is bursting with creativity the way you can put together all these crazy weapons and you've got this move set that just gets more and more expansive as you unlock amps and collect more things and you make one unique move set even more fantastic by adding other abilities on top of it and you just you just keep finding new things to do new places to go i i, I will tell you though when i say new places to go here's the one thing that i i wish the game does have and if we get dlc or a sequel i hope they fix this um, is I would like a little more variety in where you are. I mean, you're in a big city, and it's, it's a game where you're in a big city, so that's obviously going to happen. Uh, you're, you know, we know what cities look like. Um, you can play a couple of things at night, but they're very specific sections of the game, as far as I can tell. So the only thing that I don't love about this game is how repetitive it is, how samey it all is, because you're always, it's always daytime. There's no weather effects that I've seen. So, you know, the environment never changes, and you're always just in the city that looks the same no matter where you're going, you know. But that being said, the city is huge and there's so many things to do and see. 
And honestly, because of how varied the city is, that even though, yes, you're in kind of what seems like the same place, you can go from one side of the city to the other, and you've ran into so many unique locations that play so differently, the way you hop around and use your acrobatics to kind of maneuver through it, that you still feel like you have a lot to do that's different from everything else. So they they found this very unique and special way to kind of craft this amazingly varied city with so much to do. And the humor, I think, is just spot on. They did a great job. The character customization is okay. It's not anything I get into, but there's certainly a lot of options there. Um, the soundtrack's great. Just the whole tone and vibe of the game, not to mention how freaking fun it is. And you just pick up missions and you do things and you kill enemies and there's and you just go, man. You just take that game, you get the control in your hand and you go and it is so much fun. So... Easily the surprise hit for me. There is no doubt that Sunset Overdrive is a game that everyone needs to play. Easily the third best game of 2014. All right, coming in at number two as we close in on the top spot is a game that everyone should have seen coming in on this list. It is the best-reviewed brand new game for 2014. That is the one, the only, the reigning champion, Super Smash Brothers. Super Smash Brothers for the Wii U and 3DS is so good. It is the best that this series has ever been. And when you look at the pedigree of the previous three games, that's saying something because they are legendary. They are so addictive. They last for years and years. And in the case of the first one, the first one and Melee, decades even, uh, there's so much going on. Every Smash Brothers is packed with more and more content and more and more polish. I don't know how they do it. Sakurai, the lead developer on the entire series up through this, this release, is a wizard. He does things that I don't even think anyone else in the industry will ever understand. Look out for when that guy starts making games that isn't Smash Brothers, because he's going to really, really be turning some heads. With this newest one specifically, we have the 3DS version, which is a marvel of technology. I don't know how they got that game to look the way it does and run the way it does. It is also packed with so much content. It is... It's, it's a wonderful thing. Wii U version, even better. That's really the one I'm talking about here is the Wii U version, the console HD next-gen Smash Brothers that we were all waiting for. We've got the biggest roster yet, the most varied roster yet. You have unique libraries between the two systems, which is great. Same character roster, but you've got a lot of um, unique libraries, unique stages. You have a lot of stages that, you know are using locations specific to 3DS-only games, and then you have locations specific to console, you know, and Wii and Wii U-only games with the Wii U version. And that is so great, because you've got two games that, you know, they even work to each other. You can get the games to talk to each other and do cool things. Use the 3DS as a controller, uh, the Pro Controller, the GamePad, the Wii Remote, the Classic Controller, the GameCube Controller. I mean, you've got, like, seven options to how you want to play this game. Not to mention the online, while not perfect is almost perfect for the Wii U version. Um, for both versions, it actually runs fantastically well. It's beyond playable, whereas we know that Brawl was kind of a mess, unfortunately, not really playable. They fixed that big time. It now stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the other online experiences out there right now. Um, a game with a huge online component that didn't release broken out of the box, that's a really nice thing. It's one of the best-looking games of the year. The frame rate is rock-solid, and there's so much shit happening on a Smash Brothers screen at all time. Not to mention, for the first time, they've given us brand new modes like 8-player mode. And when you take Smash Brothers and elevate it to 8 players on an even bigger stage, how does this game work? How do, it's, it's made out of magic pixie dust. I don't know how this game works as well as it does and looks as good as it does. But that's it, man. That's that Nintendo magic that no one else can do quite like they can. They, it, it, they could take a rock and make a game that looks better visually than a PS4 or a PC game. It's stupid. I don't know how they do it. They are straight up, they're wizards, and it's amazing. So, Smash Brothers, the most addictive, best playing, best looking Smash Brothers game to date. And again, Smash Brothers being one of the most legendary series and best selling and highly lauded series in video game history, that's saying something. Whatever you're doing, get off of your ass and go play Smash Brothers right now. Alrighty, and a long video is what I always make when it comes to these things, but I like to think it's worth it. Here we are, we finally made it to number one, and at this point, you probably know what that game is. It is the one, the only, the Queen Bayonetta 2, because Jesus aged Christ, this game is better than any video game has the right to be. Easily one of the five best games I've probably ever played. It is a marvel to behold, just like Smash Brothers before, but even more so. It is... A gorgeous game. It looks better than most games on this list. Uh, not all games, but most games. Again, running at a rock-solid 60 frames per second with the occasional slowdown, but the fact that 99.5% of this game runs so smoothly, 
is just so amazing. They have taken a game that already was one of the best controlling action games of its time and made it even better. It's faster. It's smoother. There's far more options. There's more weapons. There's more combos. There's more playability. You go to way more varied locations than even the first crazy game. The story is as typically nonsensical as ever, but you have this amazing side protagonist that's joining your adventure with you, a character named Loki, and he adds so much not only to Bayonetta's character, but to the story. Bayonetta finally has more interesting things to do and say, more so than ever. She feels more like her own woman and not just the person running through this crazy but great game spouting off these lines. It's like she matters, she has things to say, and they've really delivered on her character and why she's so amazing and so interesting and important. Um, there's a crazy world going on here. Platinum Games did something amazing. Also, one uh, I think it's the second best reviewed new game of the year. So very interesting that Nintendo and the Wii U um, had two exclusive games that were the best reviewed games of the year. Again, not including re- a couple remasters that did, you know, were re-releases that did review better than these games. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't even know what else there is to say about Bayonetta. It's a game that is relentless. It never stops. It never stops doing something new even 10 or 12 hours into it when you're coming to the end. You're, it's like you're doing boss battle after boss battle. A- anyone who out there who doesn't know or understand Bayonetta or has never played it, you just don't know what you're missing. I can't tell you enough why you need to experience this series. That goes for the first game as well, which was one of the best games of the entire last generation and it almost won Game of the Year in 2010 when it was released here in the States. So the franchise, the character, the universe, and series is amazing. Platinum Games is just a really special studio that everyone should be paying attention to. And now so more than ever, people are because of the kind of success that Bayonetta 2 has been gathering. So Platinum Games is on the radar in a very big way because of this, and it's deservedly so. Bayonetta 2, it, it's, it's just video game bliss. It puts to shame everything else behind it. Everything on this list up until then... All amazing games that are worth your time and money, they are nothing compared to how good I think Bayonetta 2 is. Yes, Dragon Age won Game of the Year, and like I said, that game is worth it. It is amazing. Any other year where Bayonetta 2 didn't also release, because Bayonetta 2 easily is the best game, my favorite experience, the best crafted, most fun game of 2014, hands down, unquestionable. It is the king, and she is the queen. Alrighty, and half an hour later, I finally get a chance to finish my list, the top 10 games of 2014. I should, you know, I should really state that they're really my 10 favorite games of 2014. Of course, I'm not making an official list. I'm someone who doesn't have a group of people to talk to about this. Um, I didn't get to play every game, like I said in the beginning. So these are the 10 best games that I, myself, Rob, played this year. Um, I tried to make it as varied and diverse as possible. There was a lot of great 3DS games uh, like Mario Golf and Brazely Default that came out this year that were wonderful that I almost considered. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a bunch of other honorable mentions, tons of games that almost made this list. Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, The Wolf Among Us, Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker, The Evil Within, Shovel Knight, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, Little Big Planet 3, some amazing games. I mean, I toyed with all of these making it onto the list in some fashion. But at the end of the day, this was a list of the 10 best games that I played. So it kind of really does go to show how many amazing games really did come out this year. And even though it was a little bit slow and spread out early in the first half of the year, this back half, man, once we got through summer, just watch out. I mean, I ended up having reasons to pick up both a PlayStation 4 and an Xbox One within the same couple months' time, you know? And I, of course, already had my Wii U and my PC. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, I got to get these other two things because there's all these games to play. And they've totally justified it, you know? It's a great time to be a gamer. There's a lot of great things going on. There's stuff out there for everybody. So that's what I want to leave everyone on, a very positive note. Not everyone loves everything, but that's okay. You're not supposed to love games everyone else loves, and they're not supposed to love everything you love. That's the beauty of this. That's why I made my list of my 10 favorite games. Games, but what are your 10 favorite games? They're going to be different and they should be. So I, of course, want to hear what you guys have to say. What did you think of my list and the games that I included? What did you think of Bayonetta at number one? And what are the 10 favorite games that you played this year? Everyone has a different path through gaming every year based on what it is they enjoy playing. And it's always fun to talk about that and share it. So share your thoughts below. Share your lists below. Thank you so much for tuning in to my extremely thorough and thought-provoking top 10 games of 2014. And I will catch you guys on the next video for Move to Review.